Most software applications were big monoliths, running either as a single process or a small number of processes spread across a handful of servers. In a monolith architecture, processes are tightly coupled and may be dependent on the operating system and the hardware they are running into. These kind of infrastructures are hard to maintain in time and require to be managed manually. The lack of automation, which includes automatic scheduling of processes and resources, enforces to use a different and modern alternative based on mixed services such as Kubernetes. Before you start getting to know Kubernetes in detail, you should first understand the core concepts, microservices and Docker containers. Both are the foundations and will help you better understand Kubernetes in the next chapters of this tutorial. Microservices are small independent and deployable processes that can communicate with other microservices through simple and well-defined APIs. Because each microservice is a standalone process with an external API, it's possible to develop and deploy each microservice separately. On the left side of this picture, I tried to represent a simple monolithic app running a classic LAMP stack. Both MySQL and Apache services are running in the same operating system and share the same libraries, dependencies and hardware resources. It means, for example, that if MySQL needs all the CPU available to run an eventual SQL query, then the Apache server may become out of service during a while. On the right side of the picture, both MySQL and Apache are running as independent processes with their own libraries and limited access to specific hardware resources such as CPU or memory. In a microservices architecture, you have the option of scaling only those services that require more resources, while leaving others at their original scale. Splitting a monolithic application into microservices allows you to horizontally scale the parts that allow scaling up, and scale the parts that don't vertically instead of horizontally. Kubernetes uses Linux containers to provide isolation of running applications. Containers allow you to run multiple services on the same host machine, exposing a different environment to each of them. Containers are similar to virtual machines but with much less overhead. A process running in a container runs inside the host operating system, unlike virtual machines where processes run in separate emulated operating systems, but the process in the container is still isolated from other processes. Containers perform all the system calls on the exact same kernel running in the host operating system, so this single kernel is the only one performing instructions on the host CPU. In this picture, you can see one container running an instance of Redis, one container running an instance of MongoDB, and four containers running instances of a Node.js application. For each instance itself, it looks like it's the only one running in the machine and in its operating system. By default, each Linux system initially has one single namespace. All system resources, such as file systems, process IDs, user IDs, network interfaces and others, belong to the single namespace of the operating system. Containers can recreate Linux namespaces, so a process running inside the container will only see resources that belong to the container namespaces.
Docker was the first container system that made containers easily portable across different machines. Docker is a platform for packaging, distributing and running applications. It allows you to package your application together with its wall environment and, in addition, makes possible to transfer this package to a central repository from which it can be downloaded and executed into any computer running Docker. When you run an application packaged with Docker, it sees the exact file system contents that you have bundled with it. It sees the same files whether it's running on your development machine or a production machine, even if the production server is running a completely different Linux distribution. The application won't see anything from the server it's running on, so it doesn't matter if the server has a completely different set of installed libraries compared to your development machine. In this picture, I try to represent the idea that you can run an instance of, for example, a Node.js application on different computers with different Linux distributions. In a high-performing production server with much more resources, in terms of CPU and memory, you can horizontally scale your application by launching more containers running your application. The three main concepts you need to understand well in Docker are images, registries and containers. There are much more topics and concepts related to Docker, but first things first. The key to learn how to use Docker is to well understand what are images, registries and containers and what are they used for. Once you get familiar with those concepts and the basic commands of Docker, then you will be ready to start learning Kubernetes. On the left side of the picture, you can see some files and folders with the source code of a sample Angular application. In order to run this application in a container, you first have to build an image containing all the application files and third-party dependencies. A file name Dockerfile is required to build the image. The Dockerfile contains a sequence of commands that will be executed to build the image properly. The sequence of commands described in the Dockerfile depends on the application you want to containerize. In most cases, the first command is just to copy the source code into the image, and the rest of the commands may consist to install the dependencies needed to build and serve your application like Node.js or Nginx, and finally, compile the source code of the application. On the right side of the picture, you can see a box that represents the final image containing the application bundle and other services installed during the build. In reality, Docker images are composed of multiple layers. For example, if you create an Angular or a React application, you probably may be interested to reuse a base image with a specific version of Node.js pre-installed. In the end, your application image will result in a stack of images. So you can build and deploy newer versions of your application and keep intact the base images. In this example, I want to create the image of my Angular application built on top of a Node.js image with Debian. All I need is to have Docker running in my computer, the source code of the application and a Docker file with the commands to compile the application and install an engine server. During the build of the image, after pulling all the layers of the base image, Docker will create a new layer on top of them and copy the source code into it. Then it will compile the Angular application and install the engine server to serve the application once the image is running in a container. 
When the build process completes, you have a new image stored locally. In the next chapter of this tutorial, I will explain in detail how to use Docker to build and use images. A Docker registry is a repository that stores your Docker images and facilitates easy sharing of those images between different people and computers. When you build your image, you can either run it on the computer you have built it on, or you can upload the image to a registry and then download it on another computer and run it there. Certain registries are public, while others are private, only accessible to certain people or computers. The image built in the previous example is only available in a local computer. To allow distribute and run the image on another computer, like a production server, you need to push the image to an external image registry. Once the image is available to download from an image registry, you can pull the image from anywhere. A Docker container is a regular Linux container created from a Docker image. A running container is a process running on the host running Docker, but it's completely isolated from both the host and all other processes running on it. The process has limited CPU and memory resources. It means it can only access and use the amount of resources that are allocated to it. On the left side of the picture, you can see the Docker image of an Angular application we used before as an example. Now, we want Docker to create a container running this image in our production server. First, Docker will check if the MyAngular app image version 0.0.4 and its base images are already present in the computer. If wasn't, then Docker will pull all of them from the Docker Hub registry. Once the image is available locally, Docker creates a new container from that image and run a command inside it. On the right side of the picture, you can see the created container running the Angular application on a Debian distribution that is using the Linux kernel of the host computer. To better understand how images, registries and containers work together, let me show you a typical use case where all the concepts explained so far are involved. In this example, a software developer wants to deploy to production a new version of the application he is working on. For simplicity, I assume that he performs all the operations manually instead of using a deployment server for continuous integration and continuous deployment. The software developer first builds an image of the application from the source code and the proper Docker file. and then pushes it to an image registry. The image is thus available to anyone who can access the registry. Next, the developer access to the production server and destroy, if needed, the current container running the previous version of the application, and tells Docker to run the newer version. Then, Docker automatically pulls the latest version of the image from the image registry.
Finally, Docker starts a new container running the new version of the application. This is a very simple and effective way to build and deploy software using a simple container in a production server. In the next chapter of this Kubernetes tutorial, I will explain in detail how we can do all this from a completely practical point of view. See you in the next chapter.